Welcome to the Accessible Hunter podcast. I'm Greg Trainer, and uh, usually Mike Hudson's joining us, but I think he's a little bit delayed today, so we're going to roll with it. And if Mike joins us, that's great. But I've got two really good friends with me today, Ricky Mills and John McCallum. How are you guys doing today? Doing good. Wonderful. Thanks for the invite, Greg. Hey, man, I'm, I'm glad that you can both make it on. Uh, I've, I've been friends with you guys for a long time, and you know, it's it's nice that we can link up on on the podcast and let everybody know what's going on. Uh, I, I know that it's the end of the year and, you know, Wild Jaeger Veteran Adventures, you guys have been doing things really for the last, what, 10 years on your own. And then the last uh, two years, we decided to make it into a formal 501c charity. So if you uh, want to introduce yourselves to people and let people know what, what your background is a little bit. Would, would help us out. Well, thanks for hosting us, Greg. And uh, my name's Ricky Mills. Uh, John and I and Greg, actually, it's funny that the three of us are here because the three of us have been together since the beginning of this. And uh, it's actually like 11 years ago. So it was 2000, I think, 12 that we really kicked it off. We started Wild Jagger back in 2010, 2011. And then... Uh, 2012 was the first year that I was out on my own and kind of going through my own stuff as a veteran. And then that was where the idea between John and I came together to like, hey, let's start running veteran hunts. And that's where we started running a barbecue once a month in the Wild Jager store down in Vilsack, Germany. Second Cavalry Regiment in Bill, out of Vilsack, Rose Barracks in, in Germany had just got back from Afghanistan. And so we had a pool of veterans that had just come back from combat in Afghanistan and they needed that. And uh, it just, it was perfect. Every timing, everything, you know, everything happens for a reason. And we were there for them in their time of need. And then it, it expanded from there. And, uh, John, you want to introduce yourself? I'm John McCallum. Uh, I'm retired CB, 25 years, 24 and a half years. Uh, at that time that we started, I was still active duty, and I was actually one of the uh, senior enlisted leaders here on Lakehurst. Um, so I got out of the uh, out of the battalions in the CBs and uh, came here uh, with the intent really to take care of my family. I had a whole bunch of stuff that was happening uh, late in my career, and the Navy gave me that opportunity to do it. And uh, so here on base, Ricky was doing some fundraisers over in Germany and getting stuff together. And I was literally with the soldiers, sailors, airmen and Marines on a daily basis still. And uh, we were setting up uh, youth fishing trips and all kinds of uh, veterans hunts and all kinds of stuff here in the, um, here in Lakehurst and uh, up and down the coast a little bit. And that's really kind of how it all started. And he, the other board member that we're missing is Frank Atkinson. And Frank is, you know, doing a great job down in Georgia. And it's just amazing what uh, you guys are able to accomplish. I know we had a really good year with taking some veterans hunting and fishing. And Ricky, you had a pretty good experience out in Wyoming this, this year, uh, elk hunting. You want to talk a little bit about the elk hunt and the, the veteran that you took out? Yeah, we had three events that we kind of hosted and ran uh, sort of call the New York office, you know, John's running stuff out of New Jersey, Greg, you're in uh, Pennsylvania, and Frank is down in the Georgia, Florida area, mostly East Coast. Uh, we ran a turkey hunt where we had a Coast Guard, Jason Shepard, Coast Guard rescue swimmer, and his brother, uh, Air Force PJ, Jason, and uh, that was a good event. And then the Wyoming uh, elk hunt, that was supposed to be toward the end of August. And I wasn't going to leave New York till 15 August to get out there to be there for that. But you got to go when things are called. So they moved the hunt up to be between uh, 11 to 15. So I ended up leaving New York on 7 August on a two month tour out to Wyoming, then Idaho to link up with another veteran, Harvey Mayer, which is one of our great success stories with Wild Jigger Veteran Adventures that we can get to later. And then out to Colorado. And then that links back into uh, John and I going down to Maryland. And I'll let John cover that. So we went down to uh, 
uh, Maryland with a couple of vets that are actually local here to uh, New Jersey. And they were uh, and their names were given through one of the outreaches here. Uh, Burlington County uh, veterans, they have an outdoor outreach uh, program. And so they give us some names. Um, and I believe it or not, sometimes it's really hard to get individuals, you know, uh, uh, to do this stuff, you know, for one reason or another. Uh, so we brought these guys down to uh, Maryland and we were uh, with a guide that we're uh, that we've been now with about six years. And it, it's not easy hunting down there. It is all day sits. It's cold. It's windy. It's rough. Um, this was the first year, however, that uh, that the vets didn't get anything. Um, it's always been pretty successful, but that's what hunting is. And everything that we do with these guys is all fair chase. Um, and we set it up, you know, the best that we can for them. And that was just the, the luck of the draw. There were some bucks. Uh, just, it just didn't, it just didn't happen. It just didn't, uh, you know, the door wasn't, you know, it just wasn't there. So. And, and that's the thing about fair chase hunting, you know, um, it, it's never a guarantee. It's not like the hunting shows where you go out, you know, that this, this deer, or this elk is going to walk by at eight forty-five in the morning. You know, it's not a canned hunt. And um, I've, I've been down hunting in Maryland with both of you guys. And, you know, you have to really put in the time and effort. And we hunted all day, guys. If, if you remember, it was cold in the ground blind. And, you know, you're talking about people with disabilities. You know, my, myself being a quadriplegic, it's getting the wheelchair into the blind. Other hunters have other disabilities that you have to be aware of. I mean, it's not easy and, and it's not guaranteed, but the experience that we share together, you know, with each other, with the other veterans, um, I'm not a veteran myself, but, you know, I, I sure respect what you guys do. And that's why I've always appreciated you let me, you know, join the team and, and help people as, as we can. Um, I think it's so important to get out and recognize the effort put in, whether we tag something or not. It's the camaraderie about being together, the shared experiences. Yeah, I think that uh, it's a redefinition of success when it comes to any type of veteran organization uh, reaching out to a pool of veterans, connecting with the veterans, pulling the veterans in to uh, whatever type of outdoor adventure that it is. We call them wild jigger veteran adventures, but it's it, the success is one getting the veteran out of whatever situation that they are in currently and then two hosting them whether it's in a hotel in maryland whether it's in you know the flying v lodge in wyoming for an elk hunt and then it's the time it's the four to five days of isolated and focused uh you know that whole whole health uh thing the mental spiritual physical emotional you know this this person that we pulled out of whatever environment that they were in they get to spend three or four days with veterans that believe it or not you know the united states is a big country so just because a veteran spent four six maybe 20 years in the military when they go home they may not have veteran friends to hang out with so john can talk about this a lot better than i can but just spending that quality time with the veterans is my definition of success. So there's a lot to be said by that. Um, and like something, you know, real time that's, uh, uh, I have a really good friend who's, uh, who's a therapist and uh, she asked one question one time. She's like, you know, I have a lot of, of uh, clients that come in and talk um, and they're vets, but they don't seem to, to open up. Do you know why? And simple response is you're not a vet. There's uh, not that we are counselors. We are absolutely not counselors. But there's a certain trust of just being with veterans that have like experiences that have been through kind of some of the same stuff. Um, I'll give you some examples. We had uh, we had a couple of vets on a boat uh, last summer and we were doing some fluke fishing. And it was just like you could hear a pin drop on the boat. It was like you know, like what's going on and you're kind of thinking, you know, everyone's careful to talk about politics or religion or whatever, you know, you don't know these individuals. And uh, the next thing you know, by the end of the fishing trip, everybody has opened up and you hear their whole life story because everybody has something, you know, similar. And uh, then, you know, people want to know, like, what can I do to help next? You know, when's the next trip? What's going on? And, 
And then, you know, it, it literally once or twice a week, these people are texting you, they're calling you, they're helping you out. Um, I happen to still work on the base uh, here at Lakehurst, New Jersey. Um, so I, I get to deal with the troops uh, almost on a daily basis and see them. So that, so that makes me feel comfortable. I mean, I'm in a, I'm in a great environment, you know, even though I'm a civilian now, it's like, you know, kind of like you never left. I'm still in the chief's mess and uh, still, you know, attend some of the balls and the Navy ball and uh, the EXO who's here now uh, happened to be the EXO that I served under as the, as one of the command senior chiefs. Um, he just had another tour back here. Uh, so that's great. Um, so I actually have a, a real target rich environment per se uh, when it comes to disabled vets. Um, and then, you know, Ricky had talked about, you know, touching on, like we talked about the hunting and the fishing that we do with the disabled vets. Uh, but a lot of things behind the scenes with Wild Jagger Veteran Adventure uh, that we don't really uh, advertise a whole lot or we don't really talk about um, on the YouTube uh, is really helping these vets uh, kind of a catch and release, I like to say, uh, because we're not VSOs, uh, but we do have the experience at the command level um, from where we were active duty and going through the process and retiring and now helping a lot of people where we can guide these people in the in the directions uh, based on their uh level of ability to either do stuff for themselves or us help them or guide them in the right uh, position to get the professionals out there that they need to, to do help. Um, Ricky has uh, some great success stories. Uh, Frank has some great success stories. I have some great success stories. And together, I mean, we've literally touched hundreds of vets, um, whether we're actually helping with their initial claim process, sitting down with their laptops or sitting down with our laptops, or uh, I've even been at a range before and and put people's initial uh, intent to file right on my phone, you know, setting up their account for them and uh, e-benefits. And now everything's linked through uh, the VA.gov. Um, it's really not a hard process, but when people don't know what they don't know, they can't help themselves. And there's not a lot of advocacy out there to help them and to tell them. Um, not to, you know, bring ne negativity, uh, but there's organizations where people are, have been served in these organizations and they literally don't even tell them that they can get help. Um, and that's kind of what we, what we do is we try to help whoever we can, whenever we can. And, you know, uh, it's just our, our little bit to give back. But that's the a key word that came out when John was talking right there is advocating. So while Jagger veteran adventures, the board of directors came together, Greg, you were there and we needed a term. So we, we can't use the term counseling. We can't use the term this. We are veteran advocates. And if you go to our website, a little plug here, wildjager.com. We've had the website now for, I think, 13 years, John. Yeah. And uh, we just took wildjager.com and we just morphed it over, reduced it down from like 10 pages to one page. So the old acronym KISS, keep it simple, stupid. Uh, we can maintain our 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 code and our website. If you go to wildjigger.com, it lists out this, the different things that we advocate for veterans. And I'll just run down the list really quick. Transition assistance, VA educational benefits, initial filing for service-connected disability, like John just mentioned, disability compensation improvement, social security disability filing, survivor benefits, referencing veterans to Valor Clinic Foundation, which is a clinic that I attended personally. Uh, this, the tax reduction program that many states have, just telling veterans about different benefits and services that are state and federal that a lot of veterans don't know about. Uh, suicide prevention, not necessarily suicide prevention as in like getting between a, a veteran and suicide, but we have had cases on this team where literally I have talked a, a veteran off that wall or off that cliff on the phone. And, and there are veterans that are alive today because of Wild Jigger Veteran Adventures and, and just uh, veterans talking, helping veterans. Whole health life insurance, like I mentioned before, that financial, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, and diet fitness that everybody uh, needs it be feed into uh one of the things that i want to cover also before i pass it back to you greg is 
you know, working with Mark Bayless over at Bella Clinic Foundation, Mark has done a lot, lot, lot of research through his Veterans Unstoppable program, and he's been narrowed it down to the three main issues. And we, John and I run into this all the time when you're dealing with veterans, you bring in, again, you take the veteran out of their house, you bring them into an isolated and focused area where they can relax and they can come down for a short period of time. We at Wild Jagger Veteran Adventures don't like to just, for lack of a better term, throw the veterans from the hunt back into that quagmire without trying to touch them in some way, shape, or form, in some type of permanent way, okay? So the main issues that veterans have, beginning with one, are fractures, family fractures that they're dealing with, whether they came home and they had emotional or uh, physical issues with themselves and they had, they had some type of issues with their wife, whether it's divorce, issues with their children, but they have family fractures they come home, they may be angry, so on and so forth. Issue one, fractures with the family. Two, veterans are dealing with pain, whether it's mental pain, physical pain, lower back issues from the load that they carried, mental pain from, from the things that they saw that they did or didn't do. And then three, the financial issues that they run into that are normally linked to one and two. So... Uh, when we get a hold of veterans and we're in that time after say day one or day one and a half, when, you know, John and I, we've been uh, talking back and forth with the veterans about our experience and the veterans usually are quiet initially. And we have to do the initial talking, start talking about ourselves. I've been divorced. I have issues with my children. I was sort of homeless for a while, you know, I did have major financial issues. So as you're telling your story, you're gaining credibility and legitimacy with that veteran who didn't know you from Adam a day before. And then the veteran starts to open up and they start to talk and they start to tell their story. And that's when we get quiet and we, we become the listener. And that's when we can listen and we can hear that they may have some physical issues that they have not filed for service-connected disability rating for, uh, that they may have some family fracture issues, that they may actually have PTSD and they don't even know it, or a traumatic brain injury, and they don't know it. It hasn't been diagnosed yet, and they're not having a service-connected disability rating for that. They have a hard time holding down a job. You know, they may isolate themselves in their house. They could be what, what I call shut-ins. They're at their house. They never leave their house unless they absolutely have to. And the main reason for that, which a lot of people don't understand, is they don't get two reasons. They don't want to hurt somebody and they don't want to be hurt themselves. So if they've been hurt so many times and they 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 have a hard time sometimes looking in the mirror at themselves because they don't really recognize themselves sometimes when they're that angry, emotional guy. OK, so, uh, yeah, I just I just went over a lot of stuff right there, but uh, just some just some information. But the key statement in that is the difference between Wild Jagger Veteran Adventures, as John mentioned before, and another 501c3 or veteran support organization is when we bring people hunting and fishing, we're not sending them back to their houses, the same person. We're helping them. And then we're maintaining the last thing I'd like to say on this is. We're not a fire and forget organization. We don't bring veterans in, take them hunting, and then forget about them. We maintain continuity with those veterans for, and then we reach back to them, sometimes quarterly, sometimes semi-annually, sometimes annually. Speaking of a, speaking of a target environment, we're actually here. We're on the base right here, and a couple of uh, sailors just walked in. You guys can say hey. Hey, good morning. Hey, good morning. We're talking with uh, Greg Trainer right now. And we're doing. Uh, Greg does a uh, he does a podcast every month. Greg, we're just doing a, uh, a segment on his podcast today. Ooh. You know, Rick, Ricky really touched on a lot of points. 
And it's not about the hunting. You know, that's a that's a means to get people out to be able to connect with another shared interest. But it's never about the hunting. It's about connecting with people and trying to do our best to help people. I mean, you guys for 20 plus years were in the military serving and, you know, being retired, you're still serving. You're still serving your fellow veterans. You're doing everything you can to be life changing. And some of the benefits that you're able to get people, it is really life changing. You know, they didn't realize that they were uh, qualified to receive certain things. And as, as we always say, you don't know what you don't know until you don't know it. But it's like a light bulb that goes off for people. And the more that I, I talk with you guys and the more that I, I hear stories that, you know, you're you're changing the lives of people with this, with disabilities who are veterans that need the help, that qualify for the help and deserve it. Yeah, I think what... Things, one of the things that we're going to that's new with Wild Jagger Veteran Adventures is our Wild Jagger Veteran Adventures YouTube page that we just started a week ago. So if you go to YouTube and you type in Wild Jagger, you're going to come to our main page. But if you type in Wild Jagger Veteran Adventures, we have a brand new YouTube page and we're going to be starting to do some informationals to tap into some of the things that Greg's talking about. One example of that is a VA hospital. Just a, a simple simple thing as uh, VA hospitals across this nation, you would be surprised at, at the percentage or how many veterans, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, Coast Guard, and Space Force, that do not know that if they served in the military and they have a DD-214, they can walk into any VA hospital in the United States of America if they have issues for anything. That and that is that's it. That should be like a common knowledge thing that 100% of service members, as they're transitioning, it should be part of the transition process that VA hospitals are for them. But there's this big misnomer out there that, oh, well, I didn't, I was, I served, but I wasn't, I'm not a combat vet, so I can't go to the VA hospital. No, you are a veteran, you served, you signed your name on the dotted line, and you served, you're a veteran, you have value. The VA hospital is for you. It's for 100% of service members once you transition out and become a veteran. And simple, just simple information like that, that like I believe 100% of the veteran population can benefit from this little tidbit, small 30 second to one minute little videos that we're going to be posting on our Wild Jagger Veteran Adventures YouTube page. And I think that that the longer Wild Jagger Veteran Adventures around, the more value we're going to have as we start to take the information. Knowledge is power. One of the things that John and I have always agreed upon is that we have this knowledge base that maybe other 501c3s even have. How to help a service member begin a service-connected disability claim. How to help somebody who has a service-connected disability claim and has a 0% or a 30% and help them raise the value on that as their pain issues or their physical issues get worse with age. So, you know, case, there's a, um, Ricky, how many years ago did you retire? 2009. 2009. And I retired in 17. Uh, so even the difference from when uh, Ricky retired to when I retired uh, and Ricky retired in Germany. Um, so the, things available to Ricky weren't even the same as the things available to me. Uh, I had the benefit to retire as a senior enlisted. Um, so like the top three in the command. So every indoctrination and every exit or tap class, I had to be there to say hi to people and say goodbye to people. So I had the benefit of going through tap class like a hundred plus times probably. Um, and still, a lot of places, even though it's required, a lot of places still don't have TAP classes. These transferring into uh, the civilian world classes, where literally a VA rep will come in, uh, someone will come in to help review some of your records, uh, medical records, professional records, uh, teach you how to write resumes. Um, but then you go back a couple generations, uh, you talk about like uh, um, Desert Storm, Desert Shield. Uh, Cold War vets, uh, Vietnam vets, um, who we have a plethora of in the U.S. today, they have absolutely no idea 
that they are even entitled to benefits. And I don't really like to use the word entitled, um, but they really don't know the benefits that they're entitled to. Uh, I just ran into a vet, you know, real time back here a few months ago. Um, and he retired just over 20 years ago. And now he's been in federal service for almost 20 years, getting ready to retire from federal service after serving 20 plus years in the Marine Corps. So you're talking, you know, 45 to, you know, 50 years or so that he served and has never filed for his claim. Uh, he's been going uh, and he's been treated at the VA for 15 plus years, um, you know, going through counseling and all of that stuff. We literally just got him to do his intent to file. And uh, like the good thing about uh, or one of the good things that we do is that we provide a little bit of follow up. Like I have a board in my office. And I just kind of have like, you know, people's initials on the board. So people don't really know who it is. And uh, I just put a date on there just to give back a text message or to call and make sure that their stuff is still going. Um, because we've made contacts with uh, VSOs, county VSOs, state VSOs, and uh, reps that are maybe retired VSOs that can help point us in the right direction. And we just, uh, we also help with that uh, continuity and that continued follow up to make sure that they don't stop the process. Uh, if they feel a little bit of friction, sometimes people don't want to stop or all of a sudden, you know, they get really motivated to file and, and everything's going great, but then they run into a wall and they're like, man, this is what happened to me 10 years ago. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go any further. Uh, so we do get them riled back up again and we kind of get them back into the fight. Um, and that literally just happened to me real time last week uh, where uh, this individual lost contact with who was helping them and they stopped returning calls and such. And I followed up and got that ball rolling again. Um, so that's like another little thing that we, that we do help with, with the, with the catch and release and just to, just to keep that ball rolling. And being a small organization, you know, we don't, we don't have thousands and thousands of clients. I mean, we're, we're dealing with, you know, a hundred a year or so. So it, it's more personable you follow up, people don't fall through the cracks. When you talk with somebody on the phone, you know their name, you know who you're dealing with. It's a much more personal uh, experience for the veteran and for us. Yeah, I think that uh, it would be amazing if Wild Jagger Veteran Adventures could go to all 50 states. I, and that I think is where the YouTube page is gonna be a key part. I've been thinking about doing this for a long time, just creating these short, uh, shorts videos the videos will probably be longer informational videos on different things and then i'll create like a short with a link back to the long video but just getting that information out to the 50 states of the united states as far as me the way wild jigger veteran adventures has been working in my life is i travel the united states i went to hawaii this year you know you go out to wyoming and we talk about you know getting exposure or helping a hundred vets. But like, if you talk to John and I, like the amount of vets that we actually get just exposed to that you just run into is in the hundreds, hundreds, uh, annually, every hotel I stay in, every bar, every restaurant I go eat in every state that I go through, there is a plethora of veterans that are just out there floating that don't know what, like John said, what they're entitled to as a veteran. Um, and I wanted to talk quickly about some of the reasons why uh, veterans are out there. Cause I think a lot of people are like, why don't these guys know, or why didn't they file? Why does this keep happening? You know, and how can we stop it? So I wanted to cover kind of the three main reasons that I've come up with or ran into why veterans are getting out and they don't have that disability claim they didn't file. So my number one reason, and I, I ran into a friend just the other day uh, in a bar at a birthday party, uh, 26 years, I think, in the reserves, and he hadn't filed yet. Part of the reason he hadn't filed is because he was active duty up until just a short period of time. What a lot of people don't know about the military is when you're in the military uh, and you're active duty and you're running around with other sailors, Marines, Army guys, uh, you have to be Superman. If you want to go up through the ranks, if you want to stay in a leadership position, 
and then just not necessarily Superman in the way of like uh, superpowers or something like that. But you have to let's cross out Superman and replace it with sort of invincible. In your own mind, if 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 sailors, airmen, marines, and soldiers went into combat on a daily basis and didn't think that they were somehow invincible in some way, shape, or form, it's a tough thing to wade into the fray and and think about getting injured, being blown up, getting shot, going in day after day after day. And someone mentioned this to me before, and I and I didn't think about it myself having gone through that thing but then it rang it really touched a spot in my heart when I thought about that like you go out and say you're part of the first of the 506 out of uh, camp Fort Campbell Kentucky that I served with in Ramadi Iraq they're going on patrol every day so you go out on patrol you get in a firefight you go back to the base you reload magazines you restock frags and then you try in some way, shape, or form to take everything that happened to you that day. If you saw a buddy of yours get, get hit, if you were around a vehicle that was IED or whatever the incident that happened just that day, if you're on a 365-day or one-year tour or a six-month tour, it doesn't matter. And then you've got to take that day and all the days previous, and you have to take it and stuff it as far deep down inside of you as you can. And then you've got to be 100%. You've got to go back to being that invincible guy when you go out the gate the next day because you can't have a chink in your armor. You've got to be ready because if you're not ready, then you can't protect the guy to your left and the guy to your right. And you're not definitely not going to be there for yourself. So these people just keep going day after day after day. And what they end up not doing is they end up not filing. So if you go multiple tours, well, if I get back from this tour, and I know I have issues physically or mentally. If I file that packet, I know that my unit is deploying again in six months or a year. So they get back from this deployment and they go, I'm not going to go tell so-and-so that I'm having issues at home with emotional control issues. You know, I'm crying or screaming at my family and I don't understand why. Or, you know, I have lower back pain and I'm just dealing with it because I've been wearing 100 pounds of kit while I'm, you know, up and down and dive, duck, dodge and dipping during my combat uh, maneuvers and stuff. And it's just destroying my lower back. My lumbar spine is degenerating. I have arthritis in my lower spine. So you don't tell them so that you can be on that next deployment. So you can be there once again in the fray for that guy to your left and that guy to your right. So they just end up not filing for like year after year after year, they do say four years, six years, eight years, and they end up just not filing this stuff. And that's exactly the story that I ran into with this guy. Well, I didn't know that I should at the time. I remember coming back from the deployment. I remember the VA asking me, hey, do you have something that you would like to file for? And knowing that I had some broken parts and issues, but I didn't want to tell them because it would have stopped me from being able to go again and be there for my buddies. The second reason is, as those veterans start to transition out, there's this thing called survivor's guilt. So they witnessed Marines, young Marines especially, I run into this the most. I run into Marines, they're divorced, they have a bad relationship with their kids, they're going through job after job after job because they just can't hold a job down because of their emotional control issues, their anger management issues, which is probably linked to PTSD. But they never filed because they witnessed so many of their buddies in combat, losing limbs, uh, maybe dying and different things like that. So when they get back, you know, maybe they're a whole person from the outside looking at them physically, but inside they're broken. There's big chunky pieces of their emotional and spiritual selves that are missing. And that's why they're having such a hard time in their transition but they have survivor's guilt so they don't file and they say no i want that money to be there for my buddy who lost a leg or my buddy who lost an arm so reason number two the reason number three is just that like john mentioned that lack of knowledge the vietnam vet with the flip phone that's living under a bridge and he just doesn't know 
the, the benefits are out there. They don't hear that, you know, the PACT Act was passed and that there's an issue with the water at Camp Lejeune. And they can now, you know, if they had leukemia or they have hypothyroidism or they have some cancer that's linked to Agent Orange or the water contamination, they just don't know because they have a flip phone and they're living under a bridge. You hear me say it if you follow Wild Jagger Veteran Adventures. I say this a few times. How does a person that's living under a bridge with a flip phone or even no phone, how does that person help themselves? They can't. So they need people like John and myself and Frank to go physically and find them and then, you know, convince them through, the, you know, our way of talking to them about our own service, get them to open up and then say, hey, let me help you. And then pulling them in. It doesn't always work. You, John, I think you'll follow me up on this when I say the number one thing we can't do, we can't help a veteran that doesn't want help. And they are out there. There are uh, there are vets that, that like literally just don't want help. Um, or they're just so calloused by what's happened to them in the past that they're just done helping or, or, they're, or they're done trying to help themselves. Uh, they look at themselves in the mirror and they're still walking. And then they, and then they, uh, you know, recall one of their buddies who isn't able to walk anymore. Um, and they're like, I'm, I'm a lot better off than him or her. So why should I even think about, you know, filing for these benefits? Um, and that's something, uh, I'll give a little story and then Ricky will probably follow up with a, with a good story, um, on himself. I was, uh, I was shooting five stand uh, real time, probably three to four years ago. Um, and veterans kind of kind of tend to hang out in clusters like they're they're all over the place and they're still doing stuff that we like to do. They love to hunt. They love to fish. They like to shoot. They like to get in the outdoors. They like to be on kayaks. They like to be near the water. Um, and that still, you know, gives a little bit of that risk, I guess, you know, that, that everybody liked while they were in and afterwards. Uh, so we're sitting there uh, talking. He's re he's an old Marine, and I'm a I'm a retired CB. So there's some brotherhood and camaraderie there. Uh, so he you know started off you know with the squid jokes or whatever, and then I'd start off with the crayon jokes, and uh, we became friends. Well, come to find out, uh, this guy was in Vietnam, did a couple tours, uh, came back, uh, filed, but then the VA never followed through with his with his filing, um, and that was back in the late seventies eighties. Uh, now real time, like I said, just a few years ago. So we link up and, uh, I'm telling him, you know, that he has a good possibility of, you know, getting his claim and, and here's some benefits that are, you know, for him and his wife, especially that his health was declining. Um, and so right there at the range, we literally took about, uh, 10 minutes. This is after about literally a year of getting this guy to try to do something and he wouldn't. So I ended up having to go through his wife to be quite honest. And uh, I had to have his wife uh, help me with the filing and get everything done. Um, anyways, we got it in. Uh, we got the ball rolling. She was instrumental in, in helping with everything. Uh, she's a real go-getter. Uh, then I get a phone call literally almost two years later. Now we're friends. Uh, the, and this gentleman and I are friends. And I get a phone call, and he's like in tears. He's scared. And he goes, John, he goes, there's something wrong. And I'm like, what's the matter, man? And he goes, I just went to my account. There's $99,800 in my account. And I'm like, that's great, man. <laughs> I mean, that doesn't sound like a problem. And he goes, well, it's from the VA. And I don't have any paperwork saying that, I, that I'm entitled to this money. So I said, uh, so I think what's happened is I think your claim went through and I think they found a percentage for you. I said, let's do some math. I said, I'll come over to the house. And we did some paperwork. We'll come to find out. Uh, uh, first time up filing and pushing this stuff through, he was able to get his 100%. Um, years he's been going through counseling for PTSD. Uh, I mean, we're talking decades. We're not just talking a couple of years. We're talking decades that this gentleman was fighting his stuff. Um, since then, uh, the VA has come in and put ramps in his house. His mobility has gone down. They've given him uh, um, electric wheelchairs. Um, they supplemented some things in the house. Uh uh, um, physical therapy, occupational therapy, they've provided. Uh, and these are all things that he had no clue about that are literally life-changing. 
And uh, now he also gets his monetary benefit um, every month. And uh, another way it's changed the quality of his life is that um, instead of his wife having to leave him at home every day and go to work, now she's been able to retire from her job and the VA pays her to be a caregiver, um, which is probably the best caregiver that he could have. So the VA pays her, you know, monthly to be his caregiver. So, so this is all life changing stuff. You know, I mean, it's not like, uh, I mean, like to Ricky and I, it's really not that hard to do. Um, I mean, time is the most valuable thing you can give anybody, right? You can never give it back. You can always give somebody money. You can always go do something, but, uh, time is the most valuable thing. And, uh, so doing this, um, uh, his wife has been able to give him time now you know, right up until the end and uh and they'll be compensated for it so that's a wonderful story with a fantastic outcome it doesn't always you know work out like that and it would not have worked out without your your persistence and and your your knowledge to be able to do that yeah i think that uh there's probably a lot of people out there right now i'm going to do another uh another plug <laughs> There's probably a lot of people out there that are listening to John's story or some of the things that I said, and they're probably wondering, wow, uh, this is powerful stuff. You know, how do I help these guys or what can I do? If you're interested in anything that John, I, or Greg have said uh, during this podcast and you want to help, uh, none of this stuff is free. So we have the wildjager.com website. We've had it set up. And if you go to wildjager.com and you scroll down to the bottom of the page, there's a donate button there. You can click on that and you can use several different methods to uh, make a quick donation to the cause. After my census plug there. Uh, one of the things that I'd like to back John up on there is... Uh, that whole generation of Vietnam vets specifically, remember the whole, like, and it's not just Vietnam vets. You've got now OIF vets, so, so Iraq vets. You've got Afghan, Afghan vets and stuff. And it's just the process, and they don't, they don't know. So as a veteran myself, uh, I went eight years with 30% after dying, uh, and, uh, which was a tough story you know john had to suffer through years and years and years of, of dealing with me at 30 percent. everybody was like rick just come back to the united states i can't help you over in europe but i was there for my kids and i was there for my family doing the best i could i really wish hindsight's 2020 that i would have just come back to america for a year and <laughs> taken care of my stuff maybe life would be different but it's not so in that process right the lord is preparing you for what he has prepared for you and everything happens for a reason. I went through that struggle. I call it my 40 days in the desert. But I had to go through that struggle so that I I understand when a veteran does not have their benefits or they don't have like their what the what they need to help themselves, the pain that it is, the, the mental, spiritual, and sometimes physical pain that they're going through without those benefits. So what I call the uh what I call it is the campaign of misinformation. So if you just mentally take yourself to a picture of a volleyball court and the veteran is on one side and the net is just this super high wall that that veteran can't get over. OK, and the thing is, what a lot of people don't understand when we go back to the old Vietnams, and I'm not going to say the F word, but, you know, F the VA. How many times in our lives have we all heard, you know, F the VA? Because the VA never did anything good for me. They're, you know, they screwed me over here this this way or that. And it's really a lack of knowledge. What people don't understand is there are two VAs. There's the VA hospital, which is doctors and nurses that don't want to do anything but help you. They got their education and they got a job in the VA hospital so that they could take you in. They could assess your whatever's wrong Absolutely. with you. And they could help you. Those people care. About you. And then there's VA benefits, which is on the other side of that insurmountable wall between the veteran and any type of compensation that he could receive, That whether it's monetary, whether it's access to the pharmacy, pharmaceuticals or, or counselors, if you have PTSD. And uh, a lot of people, the number one thing that John and I have identified 
And and this is one of the things that, you know, as a board of director member for Wild Jagged Veteran Adventures, I really wish if anybody out there can help me do this, I would go to Congress and sit in front of Congress and ask them why. Why do service members that go to a VA hospital when they get a doctor's notice that tells them they have hypothyroidism verging on leukemia and then when they get this 10 page thing in the mail and they can't read it, they don't understand it. There's a small paragraph on one page that's in fine print that says, Oh, by the way, this diagnosis from Dr. So-and-so that you have hypothyroidism verging on leukemia is not linked to VA benefits. If you, you know, this isn't just because you receive this diagnosis doesn't mean that you filed. So the veteran goes through it. They read the first few paragraphs. Hey, Rick, can you help me read this and stuff? Nobody's telling them that that the value of that piece of paper, that they need to take that paperwork and get it over that wall to VA benefits and file that stuff in VA benefits for a service-connected disability rating, which is linked to many times a monetary compensation, but it's also linked to access to counselors, access to pharmaceuticals, access to your primary care provider at the VA so that you can continue to be treated. Uh, and that's that's one of the key things. I don't understand why uh, doctors and nurses and employees at the VA hospital do not look a veteran in the face and actively say, hey, you need to take that letter and file it using a VSO, a veteran service officer, with VA benefits. Why, why that's out there, I don't understand. Uh, that's one of the things that I'm trying to get to the bottom of. And again, I would be willing to go stand in front of Congress or link into any official in the United States government and, and ask them, why is this a standing policy uh, that maybe the employees of VA hospitals sign some non-disclosure agreement that says that they will not uh, speak to veterans about their benefits? They're there to assess and to help them, but not to. I think there should be an office at the bottom floor by the exit a VA benefits like office where as they're flying through, there should be somebody standing at the door. Hey, have you been found with a new illness or sickness? That's a service connected, you know, come on into our office and let us help you file it. Uh, Rick, I, I just want to stop you for a second. We had Frank Atkinson join us late from uh, Georgia. I know you're vacationing in Florida, Frank, but I wanted to pull you in here real quick. It's good to see you, buddy. Hey, good seeing you, Greg. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's, hey, uh, great Frank. Crew come together this morning. Man, it, it, it's great that we can have all, all four board members on. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. And I was just to piggyback, uh, Ricky, what you were saying, one, one of the things too, at the state level, there are your VA representatives, that, and at least for the state of Georgia and, and a couple other states that I know that uh, guys have spoken to about this. And you know what's funny is, Nobody knows who they are. <laughs> you know, nobody really knows. First of all, those guys aren't getting out to the, to the community events. And the reason I say that is during my fishing tournament, we had one of those guys show up and he, to his, you know, to his own credit, he said, he goes, we've got to do more to get out to where we see, you know, nonprofits like what we do. Um, and anytime there's veteran, any kind of veteran event, community event, we need to get out there and get our face out there to share the, the different um, uh, of opportunity or uh, uh, yeah opportunities out there for them to improve their overall well being in general, and that was kind of surprising me at the fishing tournament that uh, and actually John was there and I don't know if yeah, he was the gentleman that got in the picture there at the end John if you remember yeah yeah I remember him yeah so, so it, it, and it's kind of unique so and in New Jersey I found every county has a VSO. Wow. So each county has a different VSO, right? Um, and they ask you to use those. Uh, and I was at an event. Um, it was actually called Hope's Promise, where uh, this woman uh, started a nonprofit basically for uh, um, battered women and children, uh, for lack of a better word. And now they come and use her equestrian uh, facilities, you know, for healing and all that stuff. And I went up there. Uh, because she's always been, you know, great for vets. And I, and I tried to get some vets or some, uh, service members off the base here to go up and do some labor, um, up at her place, you know, cause I'm, uh, she, she wanted the vets to go up there and ride the horses and stuff like that. And I'm like, well, why don't we use the vets to, to do some work? 
and then we can let them have some fun, you know? Um, she goes, yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, so anywho, um, so I met this other woman up there who's actually a state VSO. So they have county VSOs and then they have state VSOs, but there's only a couple of them in New Jersey. And even though, even though New Jersey is a small state, it's a huge area for just a couple of people to cover for a state VSO. Yeah. And, and then I've discovered recently that uh, VFWs also have people that are VSO certified or qualified, and they're kind of hidden in these VFWs and uh, AMVETs and these different organizations, uh, Fleet Reserve, AMVETs, um, American Legions, uh, VFWs, uh, where some of them actually have, I'm going to do a little, you know, speaking bits on, you know, the weekly meetings that they have, uh, that they also have internal VSOs, but they're only going to help the people with that specific organization. So if you're not a car carrying member to that VFW, that VSO is not going to help you out. Um, but again, you know, knowledge is power uh, and just getting them, you know, getting the people out there to get the help that they need. So. Yeah, I, I think that's the difficulty. I think we're all seeing it. And that's one reason why we create what we do, you know, so that we can connect veterans in nature, connect them to other veterans and to connect them to those programs that are out there can improve their overall quality of life. And and um, I mean, really a testament to what what. To be honest, I'm not uh, as good as I should be by no means. But what you and Ricky do on one on one advising and mentoring these guys and getting them there uh, to where they need to be that that is certainly what I think separates us from a, a lot of other nonprofits that we have that personal touch uh, like that. But um, uh, I mean, but we're trying to fill a gap that we've identified. And and Ricky's right. Our our local state and federal representatives uh and i know i've spoke to to mine back home he's now a state senator and he's all on board with it but he just doesn't know he doesn't you know he's busy doing what they do when they're in legislation right. and and you know he he's he's and they they fill their docket if you will with the things that they want to and, and it's hard to be uh as we should be advocates for our brothers and sisters that are com you know our comrades in arms yeah, I think yeah. that there's been just like veterans. So John uh, alluded to this earlier. Veterans get tired of trying to help themselves. And then, you know, veterans aren't the type of people that want to have to ask for help anyways. You know, they didn't join the military because they're that kind of service oriented people. You know, they're, you know, if they weren't in the military or even went before they were in the military or after they got out of the military, they're firemen, they're paramedics, they're police officers. So they're service oriented. They're not the kind of person that's going to go out and look to help themselves. OK, that's part of the background with Wild Jagger Veteran Adventures. And I think every 501c3, why are 501c3s, why are not-for-profits popping up all over the United States? And I think the American population as a whole also has fatigue. So just like veterans have fatigue from trying to file and trying to help themselves, and then they quit, the American population has been asking, why does this keep happening? And how can we make this change? So there's a fatigue there just on the population, right? The military, the 1% of the United States of America, and then the people of the United States who are dealing with the veterans, the 90% that we served for. So it's veterans that are helping veterans. And just, I wanted to share some of this success. I've kind of been holding this uh, information back. But I wanted to text you guys on this. So just the importance for, our, for the people that are out there listening to this podcast, the importance of going to the VA with your DD-214, walking in, if you serve the day in your life. I was in a, a group of, of veterans the other day with the, with the Three Rangers Foundation, and these were like 50 or 60 different rangers, senior non-coms and officers. And I said, just by a show of hands, how many of the people in this chat room right now have are registered with a VA hospital? It's about 50% of the people that were in that room raised their hand. That's 50% that didn't. So what we're trying to do is get people just in the hospital and people do not understand the value of a service-connected disability rating, but the value of the VA hospital, having a primary care provider, 
having an annual meeting with your primary care provider where they draw blood, they discuss your previous year's stuff, and you have somebody that cares. You don't have to tell your story again and again and again. You have the same primary care provider at that VA from your the main city that's near you. And then getting the diagnose and then getting that paperwork to a VSO, a veteran service officer, as John mentioned, and getting it to VA benefits so you can get a service-connected disability rating. So I'm going to share a quick success with Greg, Frank, and John in the open on this podcast. I helped a guy down the street named Bob, the Navy CB, was in Vietnam, and he had uh, hypothyroidism, not all the way into the leukemia area, but it was definitely found to be service-connected under the PACT Act, linked to Agent Orange, and he ended up getting 30%. And I even, uh, Frank, we talk about like the stuff we don't know, even as a 501c3 veteran advocate, we don't know everything. We're learning as we go. That's so right. Bob, we took Bob out, yeah. my wife and I took Bob out to dinner the other night. He's got 30%. And we all look at the numbers and we're like, okay, here's the benefits you get at 50%. Here's the benefits you get at 70%. 70% is a key number for these. 100% is... I had no clue. Bob had surgery on his eyes. He was having vision issues. He was having cataracts and he was having vision issues. He went to the VA at 30% disability rating. The surgery on his eyes was free. He's getting ready to have a knee replacement. Former Navy CB with 30% disability. He's getting ready to have a knee replacement. It's going to be free. The amount of money that veterans can save simply by taking your DD-214 and going down. And I had no clue that only at 30% that some of those things would be free for a veteran. And a, and a, a, a cadetic. I just wanted to share that life information. It is, it is life-changing, guys. And I, I so appreciate everything you guys do on a daily basis for our veterans. And I really appreciate you taking the time to come on the podcast today. We're going to have to have you back on maybe individually and, we can unpack some of the more uh, uh, details and, and everything, but we're going to have to kind of wrap it up today. But I, I really appreciate everything you guys do on a daily basis. And I'm looking forward to being part of the team in uh, 2024 and all the events that we're going to be doing. And uh, I appreciate everything you do. Thank Thanks, you for Thanks for having me, Greg. You, you bet, guys. Take care.